Fighting Cold. Fighting Cold. Fighting Cold. Fighting Cold. By Jeff Carpenter. Pain hit him like a spear in the gut. He was hungry, but he knew that thing out there was too. And he knew its kind never left wounded prey until they could pick the bones clean. He was sheltered, safe for now, or so he hoped, dug into his snow cave. He shifted his body, bumping up against the cold walls. He couldn't see his right arm, and maybe that was for the best. The solidity of the snow walls comforted him, but it was a frozen comfort, a chilled comfort for his cold, tired bones. A sound carried over the crisp air. His ears pricked up, chattering. An incessant clacking that assaulted his ears. It was his own noise. With every intake of breath, he could feel the sharp, cold shoot through his teeth. His teeth chattered, but he could not feel them. He longed for another familiar sound, a sound that would take him home. In his breast pocket was a cell phone with very low battery charge. He was far out of range of any known cell tower, but he still had some voice messages saved that he'd listened to before the blizzard hit. One from his father at the hunting lodge. Christmas was approaching, and his father had exhorted him to check the trap lines one more time before the big snow hit hard and stranded them. He was sure his father had attempted a search for him, but the guests had gone home for the holidays, and the wheelchair would have been useless, much beyond the packed-down paths around the cabin in the snow. Another message from his little girl back in the city, complaining about her new braces and how they hurt her teeth and made her lips bleed when she practiced her carols for the choir. She would be caroling out there tonight, braving the cold in her sore gums to spread her joy to the world around her. She'd left him one last message, but he would leave that one unheard until he really needed to hear it. He would survive. For her. He exhaled and felt the steamy breath in front of his face. He tried to breathe warmth into his fingers on his left hand, but they were well past numb now. Out there was the only hope for life. But death lurked there in the shadows. Shadows. If he did nothing... If he curled up in his icy tomb and let sleep overtake him, the beast would have him still. It would dig in and dig him out, scavenge his cold, tired bones like a grave robber. The beast's teeth would crunch and crush the bones and frozen flesh of his rigid corpse, just as easily as if he had offered himself to it. It would swallow him in huge, choking gulps, and then he would be gone and it would be night forever. He closed his eyes, tight enough to shut out the images in his brain, the creature invading the hole with its snout, slavering to get at the bloody, sweating slab of meat still living inside. If only he could last through the night, then maybe one more night. It was just the last night that it all had happened. The avalanche had thrown a tree on top of him. Brought a whole damn tree down on top of him. It must have been the rifle shot that set it off. It must have been. From behind him, the rumble came out of nowhere. The tree had torn his arm from his shoulder and left it gashed and bleeding. When he came to with a violent tug on his arm socket, The beast's beady red eyes dared him to wrench his arm back into place. He let the animal take his prize. It was no good to him anymore anyway. But now, the beast knew he was weakened and had limited mobility, had limited range, had tasted mortality, and was handicapped. It would come again and again to test its prey's strength and its ebbing will to survive. If he could only make it to the tree... The upturned tree, its branches ready-made kindling, the waterproof matches in his pocket were still good, he hoped. Fire. A glorious fire could be kindled, 
bringing warmth to this long night, warming his belly, slacking his thirst, thawing his fingers. The beast would feed him its long, dense fur. The oil in its hairs would keep the frost off of him. His boot would hold enough snow to melt into drinking water. His left hand clenched into a fist. It needed to hold something, something solid. His bolt-action Remington had been broken and buried by the tree's weight. No weapon, still. The branches could make a spear, but he didn't have a knife to sharpen it. Teeth. He had teeth, as did the beast, of course, and he would pit his molars, canines, incisors, and his dizzy brain against the animals. He had thirty-two. Thirty-one after that drunken brawl. Molars for grinding, incisors for biting and cutting. Canines, his eye teeth, for tearing and ripping. He would chew the bark and spit it out. He would chew the fleshy tip of his branch into a wicked sharp point of death dealing. Plunge it into the gut of the ravenous animal, finally killing its hunger. He had no fingers, not that he could feel any way. He could pull himself to the tree, but that could loosen the shirt of his makeshift tourniquet and open the flow of blood again. He can feel himself succumbing to the cold, to his leaking blood, to the dark night all around. It was now or never, his eyelids flutter, to sleep or... He moves. He pushes out the hole, crawling at first, then limping, stooping, gradually more erect, from animal to man, a momentary recurrence of evolutionary strides. He can do it. He is doing it. His numb fingers find the tree. With a grunt, he feebly snaps off twigs. He clutches them clumsily in his single arm. They slip and fall out. He scoops them up again. He collects and breaks off branches of various sizes from the falling tree, smaller for kindling, larger for the main fuel of the fire. He stacks them in a rickety pyramid. His hand, curled like a useless claw, clutches the matchbox to his chest. He pulls out one match with his teeth. His lips tremble as he bends his head to the matchbox striking surface. The match flares up and burns his lips. It falls to the snow and fizzles. He tries again and manages to catch it aflame. He ignites the pyramid stack of wood. With the warmth comes the feeling back into his fingers. He bites into the fleshy wood, his lips curling at the bitter taste of bark. He grinds away at the wood, periodically spitting out the pulpy ball of mulch. He wipes the wood juice running down his chin with the back of his hand. The hot saliva runs cold and icy down his chin, almost freezing solid before running down his neck collar. He breaks a tooth and whimpers in pain. Then he stops. He sees a movement, motion at the edge of the perimeter of the circle of firelight. His eyes dart to the right, scanning the flickering shadows and darkness beyond. He holds the rim of the boot collar to his lips, awaiting the refreshing slake of liquid to quench his thirst. The smell hits him first, the foul, pungent odor. Then the crushing weight of the beast slams into his chest, bowling him over. His arms flail to fight for balance, but he's gone, and so is his boot, flung into the fire, splashing water it sizzles and steams. And then the wolverine growls and makes his slow advance, halting limping. The beast leaps on him, snarling, slavering hot spit and wet saliva on his face. He turns his head, avoiding its snapping teeth, the hot breath on his face. It pushes on top of him for better advantage. It will have him soon. He can feel himself losing the battle. His eyelids flutter. To sleep or... He bites into the exposed neck of the beast through wet fur. The beast jerks and rears back, giving him enough room to reach his stride and grab the spear. He plunges the spear deep into the belly of the beast. It howls in agony and its tongue lolls in its mouth, tasting mortality. The wolverine slumps to the ground, its fur bathed in the orange glow of the fire. He raises his stick in victory. He circles the body of the wolverine, watching it closely the steam escaping from the gash in its belly as it slowly cools to the outside temperature.
Snap! Two bite into his ankle, the shin bone of his leg fractures, the unrelenting metal jaws of one of his steel traps enclose his lower leg. He hits the ground hard. He stares at the wolverine's missing foreleg, the nub where it had bitten it off to escape, and then his own missing arm. The wolverine's eyes now closed, its soft lashes whiting over the fresh snowflakes. His lashes, too, grow heavy with white flakes. The flickering flames of the fire die to embers. His eyelids flutter. He takes the cell phone out of his breast pocket. One last unheard message. He clicks it. It is his daughter, singing softly. He closes his eyes and listens to the carol on repeat until the battery dies. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh hear. A thought passes through his frozen mind. To sleep or... 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 I'll Be Home for Christmas by Shane Migliavaca, a weekly spooky original. It's never gonna stop, Catwalker said to herself, watching his never-ending white fell outside. The dying embers of the day cast a soft glow that lit the snow-covered landscape in a blood-red hue. The wind howled, making the old walls of the house creak and strain. Cat was alone in the parlor, the gathering place for most of the social activity at Black Oaks. A tall Christmas tree sat in the room's center, its lights blinking on and off. The smell of cinnamon delighted Cat's senses. Cinnamon cookie ornaments hung from the tree branches, crafted in various Christmas-related forms. Santa, Frosty, Snowflakes, and Christmas trees. All lovingly made by Black Oak's resident cook, Mallory Horst. A fire crackled in the fireplace, and the scent of burning wood hung in the air. The sound of whiskey flowing over ice pulled Kat from her thoughts. She watched fellow student Georgina Harris enter, reflected in the glass of the window. Georgina returned her metal flask to the folds of her expensive robe before crashing to the couch. The chic brunette lounged on the couch, her sleek legs visible at the robe's part. Taking a sip of whiskey, she lit a cigarette. The weather outside is indeed frightful, little kitten. Cat turned, angry at the interruption. She spun around so fast her long raven black hair fell across her eyes, stinging them. What are you doing? Cat blurted out, her anger getting the better of her. Working towards a career in alcoholism and nicotine addiction? Georgina smirked, raising her glass in a toast. Just like dear old mom. You know the rules, Cat said. If Miss Keen sees you, her voice lowered, as if saying the woman's name would summon the headmistress out of thin air. Don't worry about it, Georgina took a puff off her cigarette. It's not your ass on the line if I'm caught, kitten. Fine. Cat gave up. Why did she care if the bitch got in trouble anyway? And my name is Cat. I hate it when you call me Kitten. Girls like Georgina were the reason Cat was at Black Oaks. She'd gotten in her fair share of fights with girls that thought they were better than her, thought they could tell Cat her place. Expulsion for Cat soon followed nearly every time. A slight red haired girl with a fox like face stood framed in the doorway. Her freckled brow wrinkled in concern. She was wearing a snug, if preposterous, sweater. Robots danced around a Christmas tree on its front and a pair of pale blue jeans. There you guys are, Sue McCoy said, sounding relieved. Miss Keene wanted to know if you guys wanted to exchange Christmas presents now or in the morning. Cat looked down at the presents, neatly arranged under the tree. She wondered how the tree looked at home. Her mom would have it all decked out with all the usual ornaments. This would be the first year Cat wouldn't be there to help her decorate it. 
She was stuck here at Black Oak's boarding school, mainly for the simple fact that her parents couldn't afford to come and get her, even if the weather did permit. Not that she was the only one stuck here for Christmas break. Georgina's mom and her new girlfriend were off to Barcelona for the holiday. Sue was still here because she preferred it to her home life. Why, Kat really wasn't sure, nor did she want to pry. The other two students still here, Lois Kincaid and Allison Gordy, were both stuck due to the stubborn onslaught of the freak blizzard assaulting half of the country. Besides the remaining five girls, there was Miss Keene and Mallory still at the school. Georgina kicked one of the presents under the tree with an outstretched leg. I say we get this shit over with. Sue turned to Cat. Yeah, why not? Ken answered. A half hour later, wrapping paper littered the parlor's royal blue carpet. The girls had done a secret Santa, ensuring that each girl got a gift and they didn't have to spend a lot of money getting multiple presents. Cat sat with her knees drawn up on the floor, clutching her gift in her arms. A simple black t-shirt with I'm Against It written on its front in a spray paint font. Whoever had drawn Cat's name, they certainly knew her tastes. Sitting next to her was Mallory. The cook was only a few years older than her and lived in town with her mother, who had held the position previously until injuring her back. Now her daughter supported her. Cat had bonded with her, both feeling very much the outsider at Black Oaks. Mallory had a crisp, no-bullshit way of looking at things, and never sat around feeling sorry for herself or whining about the shit life had handed her. It was something Cat aspired to do herself. Mallory's secret Santa bought her a simple pendant necklace. She wore it proudly around her neck, turning to smile at Cat as they all laughed at one of Miss Keene's stories. Cat drifted in and out of the story the woman was telling. Her ears picked up bits and pieces of the news playing on the TV behind them. The storm of the century, flights canceled, power outages, escaped mental patients, pile up on the throughway. The girls all laughed again and Cat joined in instinctively. Her thoughts turned back towards home. Were Mom and Dad celebrating tonight? Was Mom making her annual Christmas lasagna tomorrow? She hoped her parents were safe and happy. What's on your mind? Cat turned to see Mallory looking at her. Nothing, just... Christmas at home? Cat answered. Miss your folks? Yeah, we, um, we don't always get along, but this time of year, though, all the shit of the year disappears, Cat smiled, thinking about the warm feeling she got sitting around the tree on Christmas morning. How about you? Hope I can get back into town tomorrow, spend the day with Mom. Hold hands, you love birds, Georgina mocked, the heavy scent of whiskey hung in the air as she spoke. Mallory made a face. God, you're drunk, Georgina laughed. Fuck yeah, townie! Cat noticed a repeated thumping sound under the din of the girl's laughter and the TV. It grew louder and more ferocious as seconds ticked by, until finally... Someone's here! Cat said, springing up from the floor. All eyes turned toward her. They stared as if she was in a one-woman play written by a psychotic. At the door, Cat added, already headed to the foyer. Cat fumbled with the door lock as the knocking outside intensified. Miss Keene and the girls gathered behind her. I told you, there's somebody at the door. Cat felt vindicated as the knocking continued. Maybe you shouldn't open that door, Sue spoke up. It could be a... you know, a... Crazy person. It might be a rapist, Lois said. Or a holy roller, Georgina added. We'll be buried in watchtowers. From the other side of the door, a man spoke. Please, I I know you're in there. I need help. Cat looked at Miss Keene for guidance. The headmistress nodded her approval. Without hesitation, Cat unlocked the door. Wind and snow assaulted her immediately. A man looking half-dead, stood at the center of the maelstrom. His hair whipped about as if alive, and his eyes were wide with panic. The man stumbled into the house, helped along by Cat and Miss Keene. Sue struggled to shut the door behind them, the snow and wind fighting her. Mallory stepped in and helped her close the door. "'Well, this is something,' Georgina said, observing the scene before her. They took the stranger into the dining room. A large wood table sat at room center." The room, much like the living room, had been decorated for the holiday. 
Lights and garland ran along the walls, and the table was covered by a tablecloth and placemats depicting Santa and his reindeer on Christmas night. Allison pulled out one of the chairs for the disheveled man. Get him a blanket and some coffee, Miss Keene instructed Allison and Lois, sending the two girls racing off in opposite directions. I, I told them I'll be home for Christmas, the man said through chapped lips. He looked up into Kat's eyes. My wife and son, they're waiting for me. Miss Keene took the blanket from a returning Allison and draped it over the man's shoulders. Were you in an accident? The man hugged the blanket to himself before nodding. Our bus it w- went off the road. The snow made it hard to see. Lois came back with a steaming cup of coffee. The man gladly took the mug, holding it in his hands for the warmth that radiated. Where about did you crash? Miss Keene asked. How many people were on the bus besides you? I don't know where. The storm made it hard to see any landmarks. The man took a sip of coffee. Ten. I think there was maybe ten on the bus. He pondered this for a moment before continuing. I went for help and... I got lost. He laughed grimly. I was uh, in the army. Some tracker I turned out to be. I used to go through the jungle like nothing. We should call the police, Lois said. And tell them what, Georgina pointed out. We don't know where this guy crashed. Where are we going to send them? Mallory stepped forward. She's right. We should get you to a hospital, Miss Keene said, turning towards the man. I'll call for an ambulance, the headmistress left. There were only two working phones at Black Oaks, one in Miss Keene's office and the other in the rec room. The girls weren't allowed to have cell phones as they were felt to be too much of a distraction from their studies. The same went for the internet. The girls were allowed laptops for assignments, but couldn't even get those online. After a few minutes, a stone-faced Miss Keene returned. The phone is out, she informed the girls, fighting to conceal any troubling emotion that might slip out. It must be the blizzard. I'm so hungry, the man groaned, his voice full of pain and regret. I'm starving. Mallory went to the kitchen to get the man some food, while Kat and the others stayed with him in the dining room. Under the circumstances, Miss Keene addressed the group, I think it best I drove into town with our guest. We can get him help and get a search started for that bus. There was some debate over the idea before the headmistress's authority won out over the girl's doubts. Miss Keene agreed to take Lois and Allison with her and the man into town. The stranger greedily devoured the tuna fish sandwich Mallory brought him as Miss Keene and the two girls geared up for their trip. Kat donated one of her trench coats for the man to wear out into the bitter cold. The remaining girls watched as the four headed towards the garage, the four swallowed up by the blizzard. Kat took one last look outside before closing and locking the door. Georgina sauntered off back to the parlor. Back to our regularly scheduled program, she quipped. Anxious, Kat glanced out the window. It had been 15 minutes. Shouldn't she have seen something from the garage by now? A light from the car through the billowing snow? Just something to confirm they'd left? I don't like this, she muttered. Where are they? It's going to take time in this weather, Sue answered. Pulling on her jacket and hat, she unlocked the door. I'm going to go check on them, just to make sure. Sue thought about it. Can't hurt. I'll go with. We'll hold down the fort, Georgina said, lighting up a cigarette. As soon as Sue was ready, the two girls headed outside. Mallory stood inside the doorframe. Hurry back. I'll have some hot chocolate waiting. Don't leave me alone with that boozy bitch for too long. Kat laughed. Don't worry. We won't. I heard that, Georgina hollered from the parlor. Don't care, Mallory shot back, slamming the door shut. The snow was ankle-deep as the girls made their way down the walk, holding gloved hands as snow and bitter cold wind raged around them. Cold snow slipped down into Kat's boots. She felt her nose start to run as her cheeks reddened. Halfway to the garage, she was already regretting coming out here. Why couldn't the fucking garage be connected to the damn house? She moaned. Sue made a face. Kat had forgot the girl's disdain for colorful language. With the garage in sight, the pair were surprised to see the garage door still closed. Car headlights visible from within the slats. Entering, the girls found Miss Keene's van sitting there. Headlights on. Doors closed. 
Melting snow footprints led to the van, but none led away. There seemed to be something smeared on the interior windows, making it hard to see inside. The faint sound of music came from within the vehicle. Is that Buddy Holly? she asked. It was indeed. As Buddy sang about a love that never fades away, Cat touched the handle of the driver's side door. She glanced at Sue, who nodded in approval. Cat turned the handle, slowly opening the door. Miss Keene, is everything all right? In response, something fell from the van with a moist thud, rolling to a stop next to Sue's feet, causing her to scream. Before Cat could turn to see what was wrong, her eyes were caught by the van's interior, which was covered in splashes of dripping crimson. Human limbs, chunks of flesh, and what appeared to be intestines littered the front seats. The next thing Cat knew... What she'd had for dinner now covered her boots and part of the floor. Oh, God, Cat groaned. Sue had stopped screaming and was now doing an impromptu impression of a Monty Python routine. It's, 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 Miss Keene's head lay at Sue's feet. The dead headmistress's eyes were wide with terror. I'm starving, the stranger's voice came from somewhere in the shadows of the garage. I couldn't help it. Cat took Sue's hand, ready to drag the girl out of there if need be. Backing towards the side door they entered by, they hadn't gotten more than a few steps when something slithered out from under the van. The thing grabbed Sue by the leg and wrenched the startled girl off her feet, which caused Cat to lose her footing as well. Desperately, Cat scrambled to grab the screaming girl's outstretched hand. The thing that had hold of Sue was faster, dragging the red-haired girl into the darkness under the van. Screaming once more filled the air, before being suddenly cut off. Gripped by terror, Cat half-crawled, half-ran for the door. Stumbling out into the snow, Cat gasped for breath as the wind hammered her. Heart pounding, she retraced her footprints in the snowdrifts. She tried to block what she saw in the van from her head, tried not to think about what must be happening to Sue back there in the garage. It had happened so fast. Could she have possibly saved her? Back at the main house, Cat found the front door locked. Pounding on it, she waited, prayed for someone to open it. Suddenly overtaken with the feeling that someone was behind her, Cat spun around. In the distance through the snow, she saw them standing there at the end of the driveway. Three figures. Then she saw two more, standing in a drift on the lawn, their features obscured by snow and distance. She wanted to call out to them for help, but something about them felt wrong, filling her head with dread. She returned to pounding the door frantically. The door opened. Cat pushed past a slightly aggravated Georgina, nearly falling to her knees, panic-stricken and out of breath. Tears and snot were frozen to her face. "'What the hell?' Georgina said. "'Who's that out there?' She poked her head out the door. "'Who are those people?' "'Close the door!' Cat gasped, warm air burning her lungs. "'Lock it!' Georgina slammed the door shut, clicking the deadbolt in place as Stevie Nicks belted out Silent Night from the parlor's TV. Cat stood, feeling her knees shake. Looking down at her shirt, she noticed chunks of vomit. Pulling off her coat and shirt, Cat walked into the parlor. Georgina followed her. What the fuck is going on? Where's the sidekick? Cat pulled on her I'm against it t-shirt. She took a deep breath, not wanting to say the words. She's dead. Georgina laughed. What? Are you shitting me? No. Cat's eyes scanned the room. Where's Mallory? In the kitchen, washing dishes or some shit. Sue's dead? What the fuck? Cat took off for the kitchen. Georgina storming after her, profanity flowing freely from her mouth. They found Mallory in the kitchen, standing uneasily next to the stranger, seated at the counter eating a sandwich. Your friend made me a nice sandwich. He took a bite from it, blood running down his chin. As he chewed, pieces of fleshy meat stuck to the corners of his mouth. That's disgusting, Georgina gasped. Mallory, get away from him. Cat reached out towards the young cook. A large kitchen knife gleamed near Mallory's side, held in the stranger's free hand. I think she's fine right here. 
The man smiled bloodily. Oh, mm, there's a hair in my mouth. He pulled a red hair from between his teeth. Who the fuck are you? Georgina asked, horrified and angry. Just a man, on his way home from a pointless war in the jungle, sick of being called baby killer, just wanted to get home to my wife and boy for Christmas. The man sighed, his eyes focusing on something long gone. And then that goddamn blizzard hit. The old drunk behind the wheel of the bus drove us into a ditch on some backwoods road. I went for help with one of the passengers, and we got lost in the storm. A chill ran down Kat's spine as the man spoke. I don't know how long we were out there. I got so hungry, and the other man was falling behind. In the bush, you had to do anything it took to survive. He was holding me back, and I needed food, so... The man licked his blood-caked lips and laughed. And then the next day, I found myself back at the fucking bus. Those ungrateful shits criticizing me for getting lost. Accusing me after everything I did. Everything I went through. It was too much. And a man's gotta eat. Cat felt sick to her stomach. She willed herself not to throw up for a second time. That night, it came to me. Standing there at the edge of the trees, it called to me. Wendigo. Demon spirit. My burden, my curse. The hunger inside me. That's where it lives, keeping me alive. To feed it. Georgina scoffed. That's a pretty fucked up story, buddy. What are you smoking and can I get some? A loud knock came from the door. They're here, the man said as he stood. I hate to eat and run, but they're company I try not to keep. Who are those people out there? Georgina asked. I really must be going. I fucked around here too long. The stranger held the tip of the knife to Mallory's throat. I was looking forward to sampling all of this young flesh. Tastes so much better than that old hag in the car. He backed towards the rear door that connected the kitchen to the courtyard behind the main house. Another knock came from the front door. Shit, I don't think I have time to even slaughter you bitches properly. I'll have to be quick. Cat scanned the kitchen quickly. The stranger could kill Mallory before she got to a knife. There had to be something else. A third knock came from the front door. With his free hand, the stranger yanked Mallory's head back by her long blonde hair, exposing her neck. Quick and easy, babe, the stranger grinned. The whine of a kettle sliced through the tension of the kitchen, causing the man to look up from his prey just in time to see Cat snatch it from the stove. Have a little hot chocolate, Cat screamed as the scolding water hit the man dead center in the face. He let go of Mallory and the knife as he held his face, screaming in pain. Mallory screamed herself as some of the water had hit her as well. Cat hurled the now empty kettle at the wounded stranger. Georgina, for her part, pulled the startled Mallory to her feet. Let's get the fuck out of here, Georgina shouted. The girls started towards the door, but the man blocked their escape route, holding his ragged face with one hand and a knife in the other. You cunts aren't going anywhere. The trio of girls turned and ran out the kitchen down the hallway towards the front door. Out there? Georgina stopped them. What choice do we have? Cat said. Out one of the windows, Mallory answered. The stranger stood in the hallway, having replaced the knife with a meat cleaver. You ain't going anywhere. I could have ran, but you three really pissed me off. The knocking on the door turned into a loud banging. The man charged them with the cleaver, forcing the girls to run into the parlor, slicing at them as they went. Georgina lunged towards the fireplace, grabbing a poker. Spinning around, she confronted the stranger, swinging the poker at him. It collided with the stranger's head with a sickening thud. Never mess with a chick from the Upper East Side, asshole! Georgina followed up with a couple of hard swings, but her cockiness was her downfall as the stranger caught the poker, yanking it from her grip. He kicked her in the gut, doubling Georgina over in pain. Throwing the poker aside, the stranger hoisted the cleaver, ready to strike down on the stunned girl. 
Cat ran towards the man, howling like a banshee, attempting to tackle him. She grabbed the man's hand, holding the cleaver. The two struggled, but the man was stronger and a trained fighter. Using Cat's weight and momentum against her, he sent her sailing into the Christmas tree with a loud crash. Both the girls and the tree went down in an explosion of tinsel and ornaments. From the foyer came a sound of straining wood as the pounding assault continued on the front door. Cat now caught up in the tinsel and lights of the tree, struggled to free herself. The man stalked towards her, a desperate, evil smile on his burned lips. She watched helpless, unable to defend herself. A strand of lights dropped over his head, wrapping around his neck. Standing behind him, Mallory pulled it tight, choking him, holding tight. The young cook pulled him away from Cat. The pair stumbled towards the fire. The man clumsily taking taking wild swings with the cleaver, trying to hit Mallory behind him. Taking a handful of the man's unkempt hair with one hand and holding the strand tight with the other, Mallory rammed the man's head into the mantle repeatedly until the bloodied and battered man pushed away from her. Yanking the strand from his neck, he hurled it to the ground. Finally free of the Christmas tree, Cat was on her feet, picking up the discarded fire poker. She attacked the stranger, screaming as she beat him. Georgina picked up a second poker and swung primally as well, forcing the man to fall to his knees. The girls stopped when the front door shattered. The three girls turned as something shambled into the house. Standing, framed in the parlor door, stood a decayed corpse, dressed in a tattered, age-ravaged bus driver's uniform. Standing behind it were similarly decayed corpses. The three girls stood tall and readied themselves for a new fight. To their surprise, the dead ignored the three. The walking corpses surrounded the man, who now knelt, laughing hysterically. Behind him, the discarded strand had partially fallen into the fireplace, burning like a fuse. It had lit the carpet up. The fire was quickly spreading. <laughs> Come and get it, you bastards, the man laughed as the dead descended on him, ripping at his flesh. Let's get the fuck out of here, Kat said as she watched the man being ripped apart. The three girls hurried out of the house as the fire and the dead claimed it. They stood on the lawn for several minutes, watching the house burn, holding their jackets tight in the bitter cold. So now what? Georgina asked. Walk to town? Kat said. Mallory shook her head. We should wait out the fire and the storm in one of the staff buildings. They're far enough away not to catch fire. We should be warm there. Sounds like a plan, Georgina said. Kat looked at her two friends. Merry Christmas, guys. Bah, humbug, Georgina laughed. The three girls trudged through the snow. Cat turned to take a last look at the burning building before continuing on. Even the devil tells the truth, sometimes, by Dan Wilder, a weekly spooky original. The first couple of years, I just went for hookers. I figured no one would go looking for those broads anytime soon. It was simple. While everyone was staring at that big, stupid ball like a bunch of deer in headlights, I'd find my gal taking her down an alley and doing them up proper. A happy New Year's for me. In theory, anyway. The problem is, those bitches looked like they were relieved. And why wouldn't they be? The knife was just another long, hard object painfully crammed inside them. But this one brought an end to their filthy existence. Christ, it was so hard to get excited over that work, but, uh, but I did my best. Damn, I've, I've gotten ahead of myself again. I suppose you want to know what makes me tick, huh? Well, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Just messing with you. What do you want to know? Um, my parents were real pieces of work. My dad drank his life away in every pisshole bar down by the docks, and my mom sold ass in the same. I was unplanned, unwanted, and never made to forget it. Except, none of that hard luck garbage is true. I grew up in a nice suburb. Mom was a teacher and homemaker. Dad was an accountant. 
The biggest threat to my childhood was the fact that I was spoiled rotten, or as spoiled as a middle-class brat can be. So what made me turn bad? I have no idea. See, back around 76 or so, beating the shit out of strangers for no reason was how I got my kicks. But little did I know, this was going to be the mozzarella stick platter before the eggplant parm that is my career these days. Let me tell you. Anyway, I'd uh, pulped this cat down Chinatown way, dig, uh, looking for any ill-gotten gains I could grab. I found some sort of amulet in his left pocket, older than my Aunt Petunia and expensive, too. At least I hoped it would be uh, when I went to pawn it. But that would have to wait, though, because beating the shit out of a man is hungry work in my stomach. It was growling something fierce. Thirty minutes later, I was kicked back in my easy chair in my rat trap of an apartment, hamburger grease mixed with thin blood from that rare patty dripping down my arm. That's when I remembered my spoils. I reached into my pants pocket and brought out that glittering trinket, now covered with slop from my chow. That's when that bauble went shiny and hit me with some sort of mumbo-jumbo magic that sent me sprawling across the floor. Things went black for a hot second, but when I came to, he was just sitting there on top of the giant zenith. Well, I say he, but in truth it may have been a she, or a human-shaped lump of clam dip, because no matter how hard I stared at this thing, I could never get a clear look at it. But I could tell it was dressed to the nines, and always smiling. What's so funny, pal? I asked. That's when the fucker talked directly to my brain. And while I can tell you what it said wasn't in any language I'd ever heard, I understood every damn word. The bit about immortality, the murder biz that would seal the bargain, one ex-woman every midnight on New Year's Eve. Hell, the son of a bitch even had a big contract for me to sign, like something out of a goddamn comic book. And naturally, that pen was filled, you guessed it, with blood. Too much, right? So, yada yada, Lucifer, hookers, and blood. And here we are, New Year's Eve, 1979. And it's time for a change. But since not a lot of you clowns are familiar with my work... Let me take you through my 9 to 5 if you can pick up what I'm laying down. I wake up around noonish. See, uh, I set my own hours so I can sleep in. A real job perk, if you ask me. So yeah, uh, shit, shower, shave, fry up an egg, maybe two for breakfast, orange juice and vodka. Then, on with the day's business. I cruise the streets and it is cold as a witch's tit out here. But this involves my work uh, the 364 days it isn't December 31st. I just kind of walk around with a heart on and get as much attention from the leather boys and hustlers as I can, marking in my mind who is where and when. See, the devil is in the details. Then I take in a porno flick or two, grab a dog or a slice then make my way back through the spank bank of earlier. I go for the toughest, strongest-looking laddie I can find. Then I punch and kick the ever-loving shit out of them, rob them, and maybe do the same to any tourist unfortunate enough to cross my path. And then it's off for a cup of joe. What? The hooker thing only applies to the killing, and I only do that to the ladies once a year. To honor that bargain. The rest of the year, they just ain't my bag. Here's the rub. I don't really give a rat's puckered pink asshole about the living forever thing. Who needs that static? No, I just... I'm just thankful that someone put the notion of killing a woman into my thick skull. Most of the time, I don't think about dames at all unless they're up on that stained silver screen. Plus... 
It inspired me to up my game in the whole inflicting pain on my fellow man game that I've been so fond of. Practice makes perfect and all that. Besides, who knows if that shit would still apply anyway? I hawked that amulet the next day for 200 bucks and a six or a bud. Where the fuck was I? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, my, my day. All day, every day. So I head home, take a shower, believe it or not, maybe throw in a TV dinner, catch some tube. You know what really tickles my asshole with a feather? Grabbing a paper and seeing if anyone reports on the shit I do. Hey, what can I say? I'm kind of like a gutter narcissist. Hey, I, I went to high school just like everybody else. Um, anyway, those rags never say a peep about me or the meat I, uh, tenderize. Probably never will either. Fuck them. Nighttime? Um, more of the same, really. I work two shifts a day, seven days a week, and that's dedication no one can match. And I don't even have a union or nothing. Now that's January 1st to December 30th. But that next day... That's where the shit gets serious. I take a little personal time for the most of the day, do a bump, maybe rub a few out, grab a nice steak from Sizzler for lunch, real self-care type shit, you dig? Now, most years, I would just hang out on the fringes of Times Square looking for my mark, but as I said, this year was going to be a big one. So, after Sizzler, I got a haircut. Just gotta look good for this. I yank a magazine off the newsstand and tear out a sample of cologne. I wasn't kidding around here, folks. Believe you me, class all the way. Anyway, I get to Times Square early, and the one thing you out-of-towners watching from your big, comfy couches probably don't realize, motherfuckers line up for this thing hours and hours before anything is even going on. Just standing in the cold, hard street milling around like fucking zombies or something. I kick around for a bit, taking a drag on a marb here and there. As I look around, I have to admit there are some spectacular candidates out there. Much better than the ridden hard and put away wet flotsam and jetsam of the last few years. A strawberry blonde with gigantic tits and braces that catch the now setting sun when she flashes big smiles at her friend. An equally attractive Spanish chick with the blackest hair I have ever seen. You can bet those two are on my shit list for sure. But they just ain't the one. I continue my search. I see a cute Chinese girl here, a, a sexy socialite there. All big ticket scores for sure, but again, I gotta feel this one in my balls. Then it hit me. Fuck, it's cold out here. I need a coffee. And as fate, if you believe in such bullshit, would have it, there was a donut shop directly across from me. I went in, ordered a cup, and took a load off for a tick. Now, I don't believe in fate. But then again, before a few years ago, I never thought his infernal majesty would be sitting atop my boob tube pulling the old Faust gag. <laughs> so, here we are. Anyway, out of the ladies' room, she came, looking for all the world like an angel in the flesh. Well, little angel, tonight's the night you get your wings clipped. I watched her go up to the counter and order. The way she moved, I could tell she was athletic, but there was more. Was she a ballerina, a gymnast? Damned if I know, but she definitely took care of herself. That's for sure. Her hair was like spun gold. I liked that. It would show the blood better. Once I did the devil's business. Literally. <laughs> anyway, she paid, walked out, and I followed her close. But not close enough to look obvious, dig? Yeah. So she snaked back through the crowds the steam from her coffee trailing behind her, which was leaving a nice trail for me to follow, like that dude going through the Minotaur's maze. Damn, she was with someone. But that would complicate things, but nothing I can't handle. 
just have to think about how to get her away from that bozo she's with. That's when fortune smiled upon me for the second time that night. There was that fool with his clipboard, and you know he was just on a power trip like no other. Just wandering the crowd, looking for the most photogenic folks he could find, and moving them right in line with the unblinking camera eye that would beam this bullshit into homes nationwide. He'd be easy. I dealt with dudes his size every ding-dong freaking day. Hey, buddy, you know that big shot producer running this thing? I uh, noticed the lanyard around the hotshot's neck. Damn it, now where did my lanyard go? I really played up looking for it, too. Oscar material here for sure. You, uh, you mean Jim? Yeah, Jim. He wants to talk to your ass pronto. Shit. Probably wants me to get him a coffee. Can't he see I'm trying to make this show special? I mean, look at the prime trim I've picked out. Uh, uh, what was your name again? Bill. I lied. First year work in the show? The fool was actually buying this crap. <laughs> yeah. Does it show? I pointed to where the lanyard should be and chuckled. Eh, you'll be fine. Now, uh, where was Jim? This way. Follow me. I know a shortcut that'll take us right past this mess. The people were becoming packed in like sardines. The rube followed me like a lemming. Right into the alley where I smashed his fucking head in against the ice-covered bricks so many times the wall started to steam from the sprays of his hot blood that splashed on it again and again. I grabbed that clown's clipboard and lanyard, and I made my way back to where I saw my angel last. And there she was, just where I left her. Time to get the show on the road. Um, excuse me, miss. Uh, yes? Pretty and shy, too. Jackpot. How would you like to come up front and watch the show? I work for the network. I pointed to the lanyard for emphasis. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Then her man actually became an accomplice in her pending murder. You have to. You'll be on TV. But can he come? Sorry. Producers want ladies only. I, I don't know. No sweat, doll. I'll ask somebody else. I turned to walk away, like really playing it broad. Come on, Miranda, you have to go. This is a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing. Y you don't mind? No, we'll just meet here after the ball drops. Uh, okay. I extended my arm, and she took it with a slightly trembling hand. I led her on and on, a few twists here, a few turns there, and before you know it, we arrive at one Times Square. And that's where things started to go south. For yours cruelly. As I brought her closer, old Miranda got more and more nervous, and by the time I showed her my long, hard blade, she'd bolted straight for the foyer of that famous edifice without any hesitation. Motherfucking track and field. I should have sussed that out. Too cocky, old man, I thought, as I played wolf to her scared rabbit and gave pursuit. She'd already roused the half-asleep rent-a-cop that now leaped in my path. I flashed him my badge and mumbled something about some teenager who'd mooned the network's cameras and the dumb bastard. He let me pass without any hesitation. I saw a quick flash of the rabbit as she bolted up the stairway and out of sight. Fuck that noise. I was elevator-bound. I stopped the car a few floors up. As the door slid open, I could see only the back of her shoes as she ascended even higher. It did hit me at some point that if she bothered to notice I was on the elevator and not running up those damn steps behind her that she simply had to go back down the stairs as I continued going up like a prize-winning dumbass. Oh well, here's to fear making folks make horrible decisions. My ace in the hole. The elevator hit the top floor. The door hissed open and my little bunny was nowhere to be found. Now what in the hell is this crap? I stuck my head out the elevator and whap! A kick right across the chops. Fucking karate too. This kid was full of surprises, that was for sure. Damn, she knocked me right on my ass. Slowly I stood and shook my head trying to get those damn spots and stars from swirling around in the air. 
That's when the breeze hit me, cold as a witch's tit and ten times as hard. The roof. The bitch had gone out onto the roof. With my wits about me once more, I bolted into the hall and immediately saw the roof access door wide open. Oh well, I wanted something to spice things up and I I guess I got my wish, that's for sure. But god damn if those sullen-eyed whores didn't look real good right about now, let me tell you. I emerged onto the roof and immediately got stung by the biting cold. I need to get this shit over and get my ass home. Maybe, uh, throw a hungry man in the oven and sip a beer or ten as the late, late show unspools on WPIX. That's when I saw her. Leaning against the framework of the tower that would soon send that glittering ball that illuminated her porcelain puss skyward. I wasted no time and charged toward her like a freight train. Her eyes grew wide and she shimmied up that tower like greased lightning. Fine, if if that's what it takes, I'm game. As we made it to the top, I swear to you, the crowd below gasped in unison. What would Mr. and Mrs. America say at home? (laughs) Whatever. Screw those tamed monkeys. This year, we're going off script for the ultimate act of performance art. And this girlie's body? It's gonna be my canvas. Finally, we made it to the top, and my quarry decided it was time to engage me in fisticuffs hundreds of feet above old Manhattan town. A well-landed punch here, a slice and dice there, and we were almost on equal footing until that damn ball lifted off and began heading our way. On and on we battled until that freaking ball was at our feet. And that is when I put my faith in Satan, grabbed that girl by the throat, and kicked off that tower with superhuman force. I swear to you, it seemed like we fell forever, intertwined as lovers. And let me tell you, This climax, it was going to be a gusher. And then, all went black with a moist splat as a soundtrack. I flashed uh, in and out of consciousness, but I shit you not, someone actually said, it was beauty that killed the beast. Like hell it was, I threw us off that tower. Then, all went black as midnight, for what seemed like forever. Then I heard a drum growing louder and louder. Turns out it wasn't a drum, but something a little more personal. I gasped as I woke up in the, in the city morgue. And as I swung myself off the cold steel table on which I lay, I thought, Prince of Lies, my ass. Now, where are my clothes? Daria looked up into the night. Was that a scream? She turned to her boyfriend of three years. His face was illuminated by the dancing flames of their campfire. The look in his eyes told her that he had heard it too. His hand subconsciously went to his belt, where he had a knife attached in a sheath. It was probably coyotes, Brandon said, reassuring her. Sometimes they can sound like babies yelling. That was no coyote. Wasn't there a car we passed up a little ways ago? Maybe something happened to them. We should check to see if they're okay, Daria said. I'm sure it's just a bunch of drunks having a good time. I haven't heard anything since, Brandon said, looking back towards the old logging road that traveled its way around the small lake where they were camping. We're in the woods. We're gonna hear things we aren't used to. That's half the reason we come out here, to experience new things, he said, and smiled at her. Do you need another beer? he asked. No, she said, sullenly, and stared into the darkness towards the sound she heard. She looked back at the flimsy tent and wondered what kind of protection it could actually offer if something did come into the camp tonight. It was her first time camping. She was having a hard time relaxing. Brandon, on the other hand, grew up in the woods and had no problem enjoying the outdoors. It was fine during the day, but 
Once the darkness started to settle in, her anxiety started to rise. She knew somewhere inside that she was just being foolish, but he wouldn't listen to her. The full moon's light played off the trees and cast shadows just out of the firelight. She constantly found herself looking around, thinking she saw movement. Brandon said she was just nervous because it was her first time in the woods. He had told her that he'd camped here before and knew the area well. The fresh air was great, she had to admit, and the quiet was unbelievable. No hustle of the city, no loud cars cranking bass driving by, no fireworks or, uh, or gunshots. You never really could tell. It felt like they were the only people in the world until that other car drove up the road. Brandon said there were other spots to camp around the lake, but it wasn't a well-known area. She had tried to fish earlier, but grew bored after about an hour of trying. Brandon laughed at her for being impatient. She looked over at the folding table where they had some of their supplies sitting. Everything from pans and paper plates to utensils and even a tube of Pringles. The rest of the food had been packed away into a sealed container and put in the back of their SUV to keep the bears away. She looked up as she thought she had heard another scream. She turned back towards Brandon, but he'd fallen asleep in his camp chair. She stood and approached her boyfriend, who was lightly snoring. If tonight was any other drinking night, then he would sleep soundly through the entire night. She undid his belt and pulled the knife and its holder off and slid it into the front of her shorts. She grabbed a flashlight from the table and walked the little path up the logging road. She looked both ways on the road, the dirt illuminated by the full moon through the gap in the trees above. There was no movement or sound coming from either direction. She debated if she should check out the other camp. She wanted to make sure they were okay. It would give her a peace of mind as well as making sure they were all right. She couldn't bring herself to start walking down the road. She was afraid. She hated to admit it, though even to herself. I'm being silly, she said out loud and turned back towards her camp. The fire looked inviting from this far out in the cool night. She stumbled on a root as she entered the campsite, and it awoke Brandon. He rose from his chair. Um, are you ready for bed, babe? he asked. Yeah, she replied and poured the rest of her beer onto the fire to put it out. That's a waste of beer, Brandon said and unzipped his pants. He started to piss on the fire. Daria headed to the tent, disgusted. Hey, uh, hey babe, we should do it. It'd be fucking intense. Get it? Fucking intense? Brandon said and burst out laughing. He turned around and saw her slip inside the tent. No sense of humor, he said, zipping up. A few minutes later, Brandon was snoring next to Daria, wrapped up in his sleeping bag. If only she was that lucky, she thought as she watched the faint light from the moon dance in the shadows cast by the leaves. Every time the breeze kicked up, she thought it was something approaching her camp. There was no way she was going to sleep that night. She played with the idea of sleeping in the car. She might feel safer that way as she looked at the knife she still carried. She slid her fingers across the edge of the blade to see how sharp it was. A thick trail of blood ran down her finger as she misjudged how hard to press. She stuck her finger in her mouth. A howl erupted out in the night. She didn't know wolves lived in these woods. She turned towards Brandon to see if he had heard it, but he was still snoring. She tried to place where the howl had come from in her mind. She thought it came from the same area as the screams they thought they had heard earlier. It's just my imagination. She whispered and tried to close her eyes. But she was filled with nervous energy. She thought about how if Brandon was awake, she would take him up on his offer just to have the companionship at that moment. She thought about waking him up. She knew if she did, he would be pissed. Was that a twig snap? She sat up in the tent. It sounded really close to the tent. The hairs on her arms rose up and gave her goosebumps. She looked down at the knife and realized she was holding it as hard as she could. The handle was sticky from where she'd bled from the cut. Okay, that time it was definitely close to camp. 
She tapped Brandon on the shoulder. He could be as pissed as he wanted to be. She needed him right now. But he didn't stir. It was then that she saw the shadow pass over the tent. What the fuck was that? She wondered and poked Brandon harder. The large shadow stopped near the flaps of the tent and she could hear a sniffing sound. Fuck, 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 it's a bear, she whispered and started to shake in fear. A low growl came from outside. A shadowy appendage rose in the darkness and she could see claws of the beast. She punched Brandon in the face and he woke up. What the f- he started to say, but she put her hand over his mouth and pointed to the tent entrance. His eyes grew huge as he saw the shape in the moonlight. The sniffing continued. He reached down to his waist for the knife, but it wasn't there. The shadow moved toward Daria's side of the tent, and she practically leapt on top of Brandon. She saw the thin fabric stretch as the animal pushed against it with its face, still sniffing. She looked down at her hand. Oh shit, she whispered and showed Brandon her bloody finger. He took the knife from her and rolled his eyes. He pulled his pants on as a growl came from behind them. The tent shook from the animal probing it. He grabbed her and pointed towards the flap on the tent as he handed her the car keys. She tried to protest, but he shook his head. Her heart pounded in her chest, but her limbs felt heavy, almost frozen. She wasn't sure she could make a run for it. The growling stopped, and all was silent for a moment. The shadow moved off the tent into the woods. They could hear footfalls of whatever it was. Brandon made his way to the zipper on the tent and undid it, slowly. Now, he said, and opened the flap. She hesitated for just a moment, and he pushed her out of the tent, following right behind her. She scanned the campsite for whatever it was, but didn't see anything. A great howl came from behind the tent that made her move. She took off to the short trail towards the car in the darkness. She heard Brandon behind her. Oh shit, oh shit, he said, and she turned around to see what he was talking about. A great black shape in the darkness charged after them, and she ran to the car and yanked the door open. She turned her head towards Brandon and saw him fifteen feet from the car. The large black shape pounced with lightning speed and landed on his back, driving him to the ground. No! She screamed, and the beast looked up in her direction. Its yellow eyes glowed, reflecting the moonlight. She'd never seen a bear up close before, but she knew instantly that it wasn't a bear. Close the door, Brandon called out to her from under the beast, which had put a clawed hand down on the back of his head, driving his face into the ground. She yanked the door closed and plunged the key into the ignition. The engine roared to life and she turned on the headlights and threw the car into reverse. She lined the front of the car up with the camp so that she could see what was happening. The beast, she didn't know what else to call it, stood on its hind legs, like a human. Its face had a snout like a dog's, and its body was covered in corded muscle and silvery black hair shining in the moonlight. She beeped the horn several times. Get the fuck off him! She yelled at the... the werewolf. There was no other way to describe it. It was a goddamn werewolf. The beast roared and leapt onto the hood of the car with a metallic clang on impact, its snarling face a mere inch from the windshield. She watched as saliva dripped from its canines as long as a thumb. Tears streaked across her face and she wiped her hand across her brow. Behind the werewolf she could see Brandon getting to his knees in the headlights. She waved her hands around trying to keep the creature's attention, its yellow eyes darting back and forth, watching her movements. Snarls escaped its mouth as it watched her. A clawed hand, so much like a human's, pounded on the glass, making tiny cracks in the windshield. Brandon darted around towards the passenger side of the SUV. The movement caught the werewolf's eye, and with inhuman speed it dove on top of Brandon. Daria watched as its clawed hand sunk into Brandon's back like a hot knife through butter. Blood began to seep from the wounds as Brandon screamed out in pain. So much like the screams she had heard earlier. Frantic, she looked around the front seat looking for anything to help, but she came up empty. Go! 
Brandon managed to say between screams. She didn't want to leave him here. She put the car in gear and backed it up a little. The headlights illuminated a grisly scene in front of her. Brandon was lying face down. His back was covered in blood. The werewolf still had its claws embedded in her boyfriend's back. She beeped the horn to get its attention. Fuck you, Teen Wolf, she said and floored it. The car struck the beast on the left hip, spinning it around as the car drove across the narrow dirt logging road and struck a tree. Smoke rose from the dented hood in the headlights. Shit, she said and looked in the rearview mirror. She saw Brandon lying there in the road, but she didn't see the beast. Maybe she'd taken it out. She tried to back the car up, but it was stuck. The tires spun in the ditch the front end had fallen into. Brandon moved an arm. He was still alive. She had to help him. She craned her neck around and saw no sign of the monster. She opened the car door and raced to her boyfriend. Why didn't you go? He asked between gurgles as blood escaped his mouth. She lifted the blue flannel shirt he was wearing and saw the hole in his back. She had expected a few puncture wounds, but this was a gaping hole. I'm not leaving you behind, she said. Can you get up? No. Just go, he said. I can't feel my legs. She looked at his injury again, and it suddenly became clear. The hole in his back was where his spine should have been. A good nine inches of it was missing. She heard a snarl behind her, and she turned. The beast was backlit from the crashed car. She looked at its clawed hand. It held Brandon's spine. It approached her and swung it at her, striking her in the face with her boyfriend's backbone. She fell over backwards on the far side of Brandon, who screamed again. The beast stood on top of him and sniffed toward her. It was her blood that had brought the beast to their campsite, she thought. It snarled at her and put one hairy, clawed finger on the back of her boyfriend's neck as if teasing her. The werewolf's intelligence was apparent in its cruel eyes from this close. Please, she begged between sobs. Please leave us alone. The werewolf looked down at Brandon, then back at her, as if deciding who it wanted more. Leave him alone, you son of a bitch! She yelled out, and the werewolf sent her tumbling with a backhand slap. She rolled into a pine tree and it knocked the wind out of her. She tried to get to her feet, but her body wouldn't yet respond. She heard a wet, snapping sound coming from the road and she winced, knowing it came from her boyfriend. A moment later, she could finally move. She stood unsteadily, using the tree to help her up. The werewolf had its back to her as it snacked on Brandon, gnawing into his upper arm. Brandon wasn't screaming anymore. He had to be dead, she thought. She wiped her hair out of her face and took a step towards the monster. It didn't seem to notice her yet. Two more steps and she watched in horror as the monster devoured the love of her life. Her fright started to fade miraculously and a calm it took over her. Cold and calculating, her mind thought of all the stories she'd heard about werewolves and how to kill them. There were no silver bullets, or silver anything around for that matter. She wondered if fire would kill it, but the campfire had gone out, and she doubted the werewolf would wait for her to start another. Another step. She could smell the animal. She could smell Brandon's blood on the beast as it huffed and growled its blood-lusted ecstasy. A glint in the moonlight caught her eye, and she couldn't believe her luck. Just behind the beast, by Brandon's feet, was the knife. She crouched carefully and grabbed it in her hand. With a surge of courage, she jumped on the creature's back, swinging the knife around and plunging it into its neck. A scream ruptured from the beast. She felt it reverberate through the werewolf's body. It tried to stand, and she held on with everything she had. As the beast thrashed around, she heard ripping as the knife cut deeper into it. It swung its arms around, trying to grab her, but failed. It did manage to cut her legs and hips up with its wild swings, though. It stood at its full height and started to back up while trying to swing its head around to bite her. 
She put her free hand around the thing's neck, under the jaw, but not before it nipped her. She screamed in pain and could see the blood pour from her forearm. With a better grip, she pulled the knife towards her, ripping into the werewolf's flesh, carving her way around it. She could see a gap in its flesh. She pulled harder. The beast backed its way into a tree, trying to crush her beneath its weight and the hard surface. She nearly lost her grip on the knife as it grew so slippery from all the blood. It howled in pain and fell down to all fours. Daria sat on its back, pulling on its dog-like ears to expose the throat better. She pictured what it looked like from down the road and smiled, thinking about someone finding her riding on the back of a werewolf. It's funny how the mind wanders at the weirdest times, she thought. She reached around as far as she could and replanted the knife into the werewolf's throat. Its frantic movements had begun to slow, and she finally had some hope she might come out of this alive. The werewolf fell over on its side and she lost her grip. The knife was under the body. Disgusted with even the thought of doing so, she wrapped her undamaged arm under the jaw of the beast and yanked upwards as hard as she could. Tissue ripped and gave way, and the beast wasn't fighting anymore. She adjusted and got a grip with both hands and yanked. She heard a loud pop, and the head came loose. She fell over backwards, still clutching the severed head in her hands. She dropped it and got back to her feet. She stumbled around the body back to Brandon but it was too late. He was dead. She wiped blood from her arm on his flannel shirt and removed his belt for a tourniquet. She looked at the monster that had ruined her life in the light from the full moon and spit on it. A few moments later, she'd started the fire up again and walked back to the road to grab the body of the monster to burn. When she arrived, there was no creature. A naked, middle-aged man's severed head stared back at her as she dragged its body to the fire. She wasn't taking any chances. The smell of the burning body was too much to bear and she headed back to the road to see if she could get her car unstuck. She tried to rock it back and forth, but it wasn't going to budge. She gave up and looked down the logging road. It was about two miles to the highway. She could walk that and hoped to hitch for a ride back to the city. She put one foot in front of the other and started out down the road. The winding path was illuminated from the full moon through the break in the trees above. After about three minutes, she saw a fire and hope swelled up inside her. There was another camp. She could hitch a ride with them and get out of here. As she approached the site, she could smell a sweet smell. It was nearly intoxicating. What was that? She thought. Was it s'mores? It was more enticing than anything she'd smelled before. She approached the campsite slowly, peering through the trees at the campers within. Ow, Thomas! That really hurt! Look, look, I'm bleeding! Came a female voice from within. I'm sorry, babe, I was only joking! She heard a male voice call out. She licked her lips at the smell and was startled to find her canine teeth felt so much bigger. She felt something moving under her skin and watched in surprised horror as her nose grew into a snout. What was that noise? Daria heard the woman say. It was hard to make it out now that all the other forest sounds were suddenly louder. She stepped into a clearing, trying to calm the campers, but the woman's scream surprised her. Werewolf! The woman screamed and pointed at her, but she didn't notice because she was focused on the woman's bleeding wound. They Don't Drive Cars by Scott S. Phillips Aaron had been hoping to sit through the entire Leave it to Beaver marathon on TV land without interruption at least until he had to leave for work. But by 2 a.m., his belly was asserting that food was better than the beaver. He'd already exhausted his supply of snacks, not thinking that the bag of Salsa Verde Doritos should have been held in reserve for just such an emergency. His stomach gurgled aggressively, 
One of those microwave breakfast sandwiches from Freddy's all night would go down real smooth, beaver or no. It was tough to bail on the show when the Beeves' pals were about to dick him by wearing their normal mom-approved clothes to school instead of the cool monster shirts the fellas had picked up the day before, but Aaron could deny his hunger no longer. He slipped on his shoes, grabbed the car keys, and lit out, leaving the TV on so as not to miss a second when he came back. Canned laughter echoed as he shut the door behind him. Aaron knew he was lucky to have a place like Freddy's all night, considering the entire population of Charlton, New Mexico, was about the size of the cast of Leave It to Beaver. He'd been the local paper boy for almost ten years now, which meant working during the wee hours and sleeping while the sun was up, and Freddy's had kept him in late-night cokes and junk food. During that time, Aaron had never seen another human being in the place, besides Freddy anyway, after 11 p.m., He lived in constant fear that the old man would get fed up with it and start closing at midnight. A peculiar wail emanated from Aaron's stomach. Jesus, he said, patting his burgeoning gut and steering with one finger. Getting chubby at 25. Didn't change his feelings about that chicken sandwich, though. The roads were still wet from the most recent rainstorm, which meant another night of wrestling the newspapers into their little plastic sleeves. Aaron hated the things, and was grateful that rain didn't come to Charlton very often. Aaron pulled into the parking lot at Freddy's. As usual, the place was a tomb. Swarms of bugs battered themselves against the lights out front, filling the quiet night with a soft, steady thunking sound. As he stepped out of the car, Aaron noticed the rack of STP near the front door had been knocked over. Bottles of fuel additives strewn across the walk. He paused to clean the mess up. There was a small trail of thick, dark liquid splattered across the pavement, but Aaron couldn't track down which bottle had sprung a leak and just stuck them all back on the rack. The new electric eye Freddy had bought set off a chime as Aaron entered the store. The old man was nowhere to be seen. Hey, Freddy, how's tricks? Aaron said, a little louder than he meant to. After a few seconds, Aaron lifted his foot and thrust it back and forth through the beam of the electric eye, setting off the chime a few more times. You in the shitter? He poked his head around a couple of the aisles, then glanced towards the counter. Both restroom keys still hung from their nails. Heading to the back of the store, Aaron tapped on the storeroom door. Freddy? He put his ear to the door, listening for some sound of the old man. Remembering the upturned STP rack, Aaron quickly walked the entire length of the store, the electric eye chiming again as he went outside. Rounding the corner of the building, Aaron felt his stomach do the hokey pokey. There was a shitload of blood slung from hell to breakfast back by the restroom doors. Aaron took a couple steps back, stopped, turned his head to stare at the spilled STP. Only... It wasn't STP. Oh, Freddy. He shuffled towards the mess. Crouching, Aaron rested his hands on his knees, his eyes fixed on a fat June bug wallowing in a particularly large splatter. Then the guy came out of nowhere, slamming into Aaron and sending them both tumbling ass over tea kettle through the smeared blood and into the alley behind the store. Rolling to a stop in a puddle of grease-slicked rainwater, the two men came up in a gory tangle. Terrified, Aaron flailed wildly with both fists, trying to fend off his attacker. The guy yelped as a blow connected with his nose. Asshole! He shrieked, blood gushing from his nostril. Let me go! Aaron continued to sling fists with abandon as the guy struggled to disentangle himself. Wrestling a leg free, he awkwardly kicked Aaron in the chest and scrambled away. They're gonna get us! Blood was coursing from the man's nose, dribbling onto his already stained shirt. Aaron sat up in the puddle, finally recognizing the man. Lucas? What the hell? Wait! Lucas had made his feet and was sprinting blindly down the alley. Screw you, he yelled back. Further down the alley, a rectangle of pale light spilled out through a gap between two buildings, silhouetting Lucas as he fled. Aaron jumped to his feet, wincing at a sharp pain in his knee, and took off after him. Lucas Dutat was the only customer on Aaron's route who always gave him a Christmas bonus, and he figured he'd better smooth over that bloody nose. 
As Lucas ran into the strip of light, the creatures took him down. Aaron skidded to a halt, panting, eyes wide with shock. The things, dozens of them, each one no more than eight inches tall, moved as a unit like a school of fish, flooding out from between the two buildings and swarming over Lucas's thrashing body. He shrieked as he disappeared beneath the frenzied horde. Aaron stared, useless, as the things darted in and out of the throng, tearing at the man. The creatures moved so fast he couldn't get a clear look at them. Even the two standing at the edge of the swarm, heads swiveling like prairie dogs standing guard, seemed almost to vibrate with barely contained energy. As suddenly as they had appeared, the creatures began scurrying away, headed back between the buildings. As the swarm dissipated, Aaron could see Lucas's shredded remains. One claw-like hand uplifted, flesh torn from the fingers. The last creature, one of the guards, darted in and snapped up a treat in its tiny jaws. The thing ran off, a length of intestine trailing behind it. Aaron stood in silence for a long moment. When he released the breath he'd been holding, the sound made him jump. Holy shit, he muttered. He took a step forward, then froze. One of the things had flitted back into the alley and was staring at him, its tiny head cocking at a dozen different angles, like a dog on dexedrine. Aaron held his breath again, felt in his pocket for his car keys. Another creature darted in to stand next to the first, their heads moving in unison. Aaron turned tail and ran like hell. Instantly, the two creatures took off after him, the entire swarm spilling around the corner behind them as if caught in their jet stream. Feet pounding the damp pavement, Aaron tugged his car keys from his pocket, fumbled them. The key ring clattered to the ground at his feet, caught to the toe of his shoe and went skidding across the asphalt to wind up in a puddle of blood. Without slowing down, Aaron scooped up the keys and hauled ass to the car. He flung the door open and jumped in just as the swarm began pouring out of the alley, skittering towards him. He jammed the key into the ignition and slammed the car into reverse as the engine caught. The car laid rubber, obscuring the creatures in a cloud of smoke. Aaron wiped a bloody hand on his pants and gripped the steering wheel as the car bounced over the curb and into the street. Dropping it into drive, Aaron peeled out again. He watched in the rearview mirror as the goddamn things poured into the street, ran through a confused circle, and then scurried off to disappear amongst the buildings again. So now what? Aaron's gaze flicked from the road ahead to the bloodstains on his shirt. He was practically wheezing, sucking air like an old man climbing stairs. There wasn't even a police station in Charlton. Nearest cop was 60 miles down the highway in Estancia. And, uh, what cop would believe Aaron's story anyway? A bunch of quivering little monsters with lots of teeth ate a guy while he watched? He suddenly felt like Steve McQueen in The Blob. He needed somebody to back him up. Aaron spun the wheel, whipping his car into a left turn. He was impressed that the old beater had performed so well under pressure. The car had a tendency to choke and die when asked to accelerate away from a fast food drive through window. Another left took him on to Howard Road, where his friend Noel lived. There were no curbs out here. Aaron rolled the car to a stop in Noel's muddy front yard and jumped out. Tromping to the door, Aaron banged with one hand and rang the doorbell with the other. After a short barrage of this noise, a light came on in the bedroom and Noel's angry, narrow face appeared through the parted curtains. Aaron very faintly heard the words, What the fuck? And the curtains closed once again. A few seconds later, Noel opened the door, still in the act of zipping his pants. Man, you better not be waking me up to help you with your fucking paper route, he grumbled, voice thick with sleep. Aaron pushed past his friend, leaving muddy footprints as he entered the house. I need to use your phone, and you've got to help me. You wake me up at 2.30 to teach you how to use a phone? Noel's crusty eyes followed the trail of mud as it extended down the hall and into the kitchen. Look at that shit, man. He shuffled off after Aaron, shaking his head in annoyance. In the kitchen, Aaron had pulled Noel's phone book from the drawer and was flipping pages. What's the number for the cops? I don't know. 911, Noel said, dropping his bony butt into a chair. What's going on? 
Aaron stabbed three digits and waited. Lucas Dutat got killed by... Hell, by some kind of freaky things, and I think they got Freddy, too. You're, um, you're all bloody, Noel mentioned, finally noticing Aaron's filthy shirt. An operator picked up and Aaron talked fast, hoping to avoid too many questions. I'm over in Charlton. Somebody's been killed outside Freddy's all night. No, it was, it was animals, coyotes or something, a whole pack of them. He looked over at Noel, who was staring at him like he was a lunatic. About what he expected. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait here for you, thanks. Aaron cradled the receiver. Coyotes? Noel asked. Aaron shook his head. I need you to come with me. Aw, man, Noel said. Aaron's butt cheeks nibbled the seat cushion as he guided his car into Freddy's parking lot once again. There was no sign of the little creatures, but who knew where the bastards might be hiding? So what are these things again? Noel mumbled through a yawn. I told you I don't know. I didn't get a clear look at them. They're like a bunch of piranhas or something. But they walk? No, they run like striped-ass apes. The car came to a stop in the same parking space it had occupied earlier. Noel reached for his door handle. Aaron frantically grabbed his arm. Wait. Staring out the window, Aaron unbuckled his seatbelt, then turned to face Noel. All right, try to keep quiet and stay with me. Don't go wandering off by yourself, okay? Noel rubbed a meaty nugget of sleep from his eye and flicked it onto the dashboard. Aaron's lip curled. Sorry, Noel said. Did you hear me? Don't worry. Satisfied, Aaron lifted his door handle and slowly pushed the door open. The hinges howled like a wildcat in heat. Shit fire, Aaron hissed. Noel had better luck with his door. It swung open with only the slightest squeak, and he leaned out, peering around. Confident there were no strolling piranha lurking nearby, he stepped out. The two men met in front of the car, backs to each other, mindful of the darkness around them. Let's get a flashlight, Aaron said. I don't want to run into those things in the dark. Aaron and Noel entered the store. The chime went off. Both men leaped skyward. They came down, gasping, looking at each other in embarrassment. Recovering, Aaron found the aisle he wanted and selected a cheap flashlight, then went to the counter and grabbed batteries. I don't know where Freddy is, but Lucas is out in the alley. Aaron unscrewed the flashlight cap and dropped the batteries in. He flicked the light on, played it around. So, why do we have to go look at him? Glancing around furtively, Noel snatched a Kit Kat bar. I don't want to see a, some chewed up dead guy. Just play along, will ya? Let's go! Aaron started for the door, setting off the chime again. Jesus! Noel yelped. Why the hell did Freddy install this damn thing? Aaron held the door for Noel. He's got that thing with his bowels. Kids hang around outside till they saw him go in the can, then run in and steal candy bars. Noel bit into his pilfered Kit Kat and followed Aaron around the corner of the building. His eyes widened when he saw the blood smeared across the pavement. Man, you weren't kidding. Cautiously, Aaron led Noel to the building next door to Freddy's, where he flattened against the wall and poked his head out into the alley. Lucas's ravaged corpse still lay in the fragment of light not far away. Aaron gestured for Noel to follow and they stepped into the alley, quietly moving towards the body. As they passed the dumpster, shared by Freddy's and the business next door, Noel poked his head over the rim, looking for anything dive-worthy. Oh shit, he whispered. Noel pointed into the dumpster. I think this might be Freddy. Aaron hesitantly approached the dumpster and looked in. A pair of half-empty eye sockets stared back at him. It looked like Freddy's wispy gray hair, but the face had been eaten away. Bits of muscle and stringy flesh dangling from the blood-smeared bone. A crappy set of absurdly white dentures were wedged into the jaws. Those were definitely Freddy's. Aaron turned away, all the junk he'd eaten during Leave It to Beaver rising in his gorge. He must have crawled in there trying to get away from him, he choked. Noel stared at the Kit Kat bar in his trembling hand. Reverently, he dropped it into the dumpster, returning it to its rightful owner. Not far away, a dog launched into a fit of ferocious barking. 
That's Jasper's dog, Aaron said. He took off running down the alley. Noel dithered for a second, then followed. As they raced past Lucas's corpse, the dog's barking was cut short by a yelp of pain. Aaron shot Noel a look and quickened his pace. An eight-foot wooden fence surrounded Jasper's gravel yard. It had originally been a six-footer, but Riley, Jasper's guard dog, had a habit of jumping it whenever anyone walked by. The dog would then follow them all over town, as long as the petting kept up anyway, leaving the yard unprotected. Reaching the fence, Aaron skidded to a halt. Noel came up beside him. They could hear soft, wet sounds on the other side, and... something else. Something scuttling around moving fast. Aaron handed Noel the flashlight and jumped up to grab the top of the fence, straining to keep any noise to a minimum. He carefully poked his head over the fence and peered into the gravel yard. Jesus Christ, he whispered. Get up here. Noel clicked the flashlight off and stuck it in his pocket. Jumping, he hoisted himself alongside Aaron. As his eyes cleared the top of the fence, he suddenly wanted very badly to go home. I I gotta piss he muttered, unblinking. Jasper's dog, a brawny retriever, was in the process of being hollowed out and stripped to the bone. The creatures swarmed over the fallen dog, tiny jaws rapidly nipping out juicy chunks of meat. As before, two of the things stood guard, heads cocking and swiveling in all directions. Aaron stared in bewilderment at the pale-skinned creatures. While they still moved too fast for him to make out any real detail, he was close enough this time to see the fleshy quills that sprouted from their backs, running from between their bulging black eyes to the tips of their thick, plated tails. Thin antennae, like those of a cockroach, whiplashed above their heads. Aaron thought he could see some sort of filament surrounding their mouths, filtering each bit of the dog as they greedily devoured it. What do you think they are? Noel whispered. Aaron tensed at the sound of Noel's voice, ready to beat feet, but the creatures didn't seem to have heard, or weren't interested. We've been getting a lot of rain, he said quietly. That doesn't happen much around here. I heard about these little crab things. Their eggs can sit in the dirt for like a hundred years, then when it rains, they hatch out, kind of like sea monkeys. Except, uh... They don't drive cars, Noel pointed out. Sea monkeys don't drive cars? I saw an ad in a comic book where they were driving a little convertible. Man, that's just for the rubes, Aaron said. Sea monkeys are some kind of shrimp. They they don't do shit. Noel was about to argue the point when he slipped, his foot banging loudly against the fence. Their pellet-like eyes locking on Aaron and Noel, the two creatures on guard instantly sent up the alarm, chittering horribly. Run like hell! Aaron said, dropping to the ground. Noel clung to the fence, staring stupidly as the thing swept from the dog's corpse and scurried towards him. His nose bounced off the fence as Aaron yanked him to the ground. I said run! Aaron and Noel hightailed it down the alley. The creatures thudded into the fence like ham-sized hailstones, scuffling against the barrier as they attempted to clamber up it. Some of them began gnawing at the wood. This time, Aaron held his keys in a white-knuckled grip as he pulled them from his pocket. They're out! They're out! Noel screeched. Gawking over his shoulder, Aaron glanced back. Sure as hell, the things were pouring through a hole at the base of the fence and running after them. Then his foot sank into something gooey, and he did a face plant into the pavement, flinging his keys away as he hit. Moving too fast to avoid it, Noel drove a foot into Aaron's crotch, launching himself over his pal and coming down hard. Wincing at the agonizing pain centered in his groin, Aaron rolled onto his ass and sat up. One of his shoes was buttered with thick gore. He tripped over Lucas's corpse. For crying out loud, Aaron griped. The creatures were about twenty yards away and moving fast, ready to dive into the sumptuous feast laid before them. Aaron let out an exasperated sigh. If he just hadn't eaten those fucking Doritos. Noel propped himself on his hands and knees and screamed girlishly, whipping towards his friend. Aaron noticed the flashlight tucked in Noel's pocket. Hmm... Aaron looked back at the creatures, imagining them licking their freakish little chops as Noel scrambled to his feet. Aaron tackled him, yanking the flashlight from his pocket. What the fuck, man? Noel shrieked. I thought of something sea monkeys do, Aaron said. He sat up again, aimed the flashlight toward the creatures, and flicked it on, and illuminated the swarm. To no effect. Other than that he could now see very clearly what was about to dine on his guts. I just want to 
Thank you for waking my ass up so I could be a part of this, Noel said. Aaron swung the flashlight beam away from the creatures, putting a circle of light on the wall, making a sudden right turn, and the creatures darted toward the light and away from Aaron and Noel. Aaron grinned. Playing the light across the pavement, Aaron led the swarm of flesh eaters on a winding chase back and forth in the alley. The things had seemingly forgot their prey, intent only on capturing that dot of light. Noel watched the creatures zip about, his mouth hanging open. Who do we know that has a basement? Aaron asked. Twenty minutes later, Aaron and Noel were walking up the drive to Phil Gomez's place with a shitload of nasty creatures in tow. The things hadn't veered from their stubborn pursuit of the flashlight beam during the entire walk to Phil's. As they reached the front door, Aaron played the light around in the field, keeping the creatures occupied while Noel knocked. It took Phil a few minutes to answer. He was righteously pissed. What the hell is this all about? He wheezed, brushing his thickly pomaded hair out of its sleepy dew. Take a look, Aaron said, gesturing toward the flashlight beam. Phil squinted. What are those, squirrels? Noel started to speak, but Aaron cut him off. Yeah, we, uh, we need to store them in your basement. What the hell for? They're, um, they're rabid. Bit some folks, gotta keep them penned up until animal control can get here. Shit, Phil said. He backed into the house, allowing Aaron and Noel to enter. While Noel ran to open the basement door, Aaron led the creatures inside. Phil bent to stare at the things as they skittered past his feet. Don't get too close, Aaron cautioned. Those aren't squirrels, Phil said. Radioactive, Aaron explained. Phil hissed through his teeth, getting it. Aaron moved into the kitchen and stepped aside. The things obediently followed the flashlight beam through the basement door and down the stairs. When the last one passed, Noel slammed the door shut and threw the bolt. With the hypnotic effect of the light gone, the creatures instantly went berserk, slamming into the door and banging around the basement like a truckload of civet cats with a hose turned on them. I suggest we nail some cookie sheets or something over the door so they can't chew through it. Aaron said, listening to the gnawing sounds emanating from below. A week later, Aaron sat on the taped-together swivel stool at Freddy's all night, his feet propped up on the counter and the portable TV tuned to a rerun of Jenny Jones. In an effort to help out Freddy's widow, Aaron had taken over the graveyard shift at the all-night, relinquishing his paperboy duties. The new paperboy wasn't as regular a customer at the store as Aaron had been. Most nights, Aaron's only customer was... himself gave him lots of time to snack and watch the tube. He looked up from the TV as the electric eye chimed. Noel strode towards the counter, dripping wet and feeling the gentle buzz of a few after-work beers. "'Do you hear about Phil?' he asked, grabbing a Kit Kat bar and tearing the wrapper open. "Oh shit,' Aaron said, worried. So far, nobody had been able to figure out what the creatures were, or where they came from, or whether there were more." No, no, nothing bad. He's still got all those damn scientists over at his place doing their research thing on the little bastards. But he's stirring up trouble. How so? He won't let them take the things away. Says they're in his basement and they belong to him. He wants to open some kind of monster museum? Put them on display and charge admission. Thinks he's going to put Charlton on the map. Aaron considered it for a second. Damn, if I'd thought of that... I had to put the things in my own basement. You don't have a basement? Noel said, starting for the door. You gotta pay for that, Aaron said, indicating the candy bar. Noel grinned and walked out, setting off the chime again. Aaron stared after his friend for a long moment, gazing out into the rainy night. Probably wouldn't be another customer for the whole shift. Abruptly, he left the counter, threw a chicken sandwich into the microwave, and went to the door, where he began the process of lowering the electric eye to radioactive squirrel level. The Devil Knows Three Chords by John Oak Dalton, a weekly spooky original. Chester Kilbuck and Bobby Lee Starr were one of the hottest bluegrass duos of the 50s and early 60s, but it all ended in a dumpster behind the Avalon Ballroom in San Francisco in 1968. Like a lot of bluegrass musicians at the time, they started in the Bluegrass Boys in the late 40s and then joined the Foggy Mountain Boys in the early 50s before setting off on their own as Killbuck and Star. Chester and Bobby Lee couldn't have been more different, and thus made an unlikely team. 
Chester was married three or four times and had several kids that hated him. And several more he wouldn't admit to having and who didn't know he was their daddy. Bobby Lee was still married to his first wife, Marion, and they had a son, Johnny, who was born blind in 1946 and who Bobby Lee lived and died for. Chester followed the old ways and the old music, but Bobby Lee saw things differently when his son started playing folk music with a couple of other guys. Bobby Lee wanted to add some more Bob Dylan and Graham Parsons to their song list, but Chester said that would never get them on the Porter Wagner show and they would get booed out of the Grand old Opry. Bobby Lee got through a lot of his disagreements with Chester by bringing Johnny on the road with him when he was old enough, and Johnny became a great mandolin player in his own right. So in the same way that they wanted to leave Bill Monroe and then leave Flat and Scruggs, Johnny wanted to forge out on his own. It was the way of things, and Bobby Lee could not deny his son. But his son still needed him. So when Johnny Starr made a deal for his own band with the Avalon Ballroom, which was the premier venue in San Francisco at the center of everything happening in 1968, he might have mentioned his dad would come and play too. The Avalon promised Killbuck and Starr top billing, and Johnny's band Lemon Dirty Fingernails second, ahead of the Stone Ponies and the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Chester was very angry with the deal, but went along with it. And as it happened, Kilbuck and Starr killed it in front of all these young people who were turning on to the Bakersfield Sound and the Birds and Dylan. And suddenly, Bobby Lee could see a future for the duo. A future beyond the long county fair tours. A future beyond waiting for someone to tap their shoulder for the Opry. Bobby Lee waited backstage for his son, who was still out talking to friends, and it was good that he was late because he found out quickly... Chester was still fuming. Bobby Lee found, at the little rickety table in the dressing room, his son had left a water bottle with a note that said, Drink me, and a plate of food with a note that said, Eat me. It was punched out in braille with the little stylus and slate both father and son had learned to use. Bobby Lee was drinking down the water when Chester banged the door open. Bobby Lee looked at him with a smile and a squint. I thought you slipped off with that little gal in the front row in those short shorts, Bobby Lee said. Chester's frown deepened. Hell, that gal had more armpit hair than I do. You couldn't tell who was the girl and who was the boys with all that long hair out there. They loved us, Chester, Bobby Lee said. They should love their goddamn country. Your son's a cripple and has an excuse, but the rest of them boys should be over in Vietnam fighting communism, Chester proclaimed. That killed off Bobby Lee's good feeling. It'd be nice if you could be happy with one thing in this world, Bobby Lee muttered, but Chester wasn't listening, as usual. That one hairy SOB that plays with Johnny has a dog he calls Roy a cuff, Chester added. He means that with respect, Chester, Bobby Lee said. You don't name a hound dog after Roy a cuff, Chester shot back. Bobby Lee shrugged. These young folks, they got their own thing going on out here, Bobby Lee said. Chester looked at him with narrowed eyes and lit a lucky strike. They ain't our people, Bobby Lee. Our people are in Oklahoma and Iowa and every little town between there and Nashville. This whole state could fall off into the ocean and good riddance to them all. Bobby Lee looked at his partner full in the face. Johnny is my son and he's living out here. And he's got a band he calls Lemon Dirty Fingernails. And that ain't a band name, although one word is accurate. Bobby Lee swallowed hard and began to sweat. Bobby Lee wasn't sure, but it looked like the walls were sweating too. I didn't do what I did to end up playing to a room full of draft dodgers and drug addicts, Chester said. Bobby Lee frowned. What did you do, Chester? Bobby Lee thought the flowered wallpaper behind Chester was starting to bloom. Chester looked at him. You think Robert Johnson was the only man ever met the devil at the crossroads? Blues music is in the roots of the soil, but so is country music. Those roots are even deeper. You don't think a bluegrass man could find his way to those crossroads? Chester's normally red face, flushed with anger and drink, became even redder. 
What do you think is at them, crossroads? Behind him, the flowers bloomed black. Do you think what career we have come from good looks and your sweet nature? Bobby Lee watched a cold smile come across Chester's face, full of yellow teeth. And then, as Bobby Lee watched, a pair of horns began to grow out of his forehead. Chester's voice came in a hard rasp. Let me ask you another question. You knew me back when we both lived in the Cumberland homesteads up in those mountains. When you'd know my family ever have money for a fiddle? When did you ever see me practice on one when I wasn't already good? In answer, Bobby Lee picked up the bottle again and smashed it into Chester's face. Chester fell with a growl, and Bobby Lee was on him in a flash, choking him, and after a few moments, Chester's eyes bulged, and the horns receded, and Bobby Lee quit his work. The walls quit sweating and blooming, and Chester looked like a normal person again, and Bobby Lee realized this was going to be hard to explain. So Bobby Lee dragged Chester out the back door into an alley, and heaved him up into a dumpster, and hoped that was going to be enough. Chester was heavy, and it was slow going as the ground beneath Bobby Lee seemed to buck and heave. Bobby Lee was grateful there wasn't anyone lounging at the mouth of the alley during his work. The crowd had dispersed, and with them, the good vibes, and suddenly the Avalon was just a crumbling old building. He got back into the tiny dressing room just ahead of his son, who came in beaming. Pops, it was quite a night, Johnny said. Bobby Lee steadied his voice. It was. I'm proud of you, Bobby Lee said. Where's Uncle Chester? Bobby Lee wiped at his brow. Oh, he found some trouble to get into, I reckon. Johnny nodded, then reached out a hand. Pops, you're sweating and you sound funny. You drink that water I left for you? Sure, why? Johnny nodded more seriously and slowly. I'm sorry, I wanted to get back here sooner. I wanted to go on that trip with you. What trip? I dosed that water, Pops. I thought we could tune in together tonight. To celebrate. It looks like you started without me, but I can walk you through the rest of the way. Just remember, everybody here is a friend. This place is full of love tonight. Bobby Lee sat down hard. You didn't eat the brownies? Cool. You eat one and I'll eat one and we'll be on this trip together. I can see things when I trip, Pops. If you can dig that. Dig was a funny word to Bobby Lee. He had dumped, not dug, a place for Chester to rest. Bobby Lee started laughing. Pops? Bobby Lee couldn't stop laughing. All night. They got on to the Opry after all when they did a tribute show. For Chester Kilbuck. Bobby Lee took Johnny to Nudie's Rodeo Tailors in Hollywood and got matching rhinestone suits for the gig. Earl Scruggs showed up and played with them. Mother Maybell Carter was there and so was Doc Watson. Doc Watson brought his son Merle and Scruggs brought his sons Randy and Gary and that made it more special for Bobby Lee. Roy Cuff was the MC and it was just as well nobody in Johnny's band mentioned they had a dog named after him. The summer of love didn't seem to last a summer even. Johnny's band got broken up by the draft, after all, and then broken up for good by the Viet Cong and Din Bien Phu. Some people said the summer of love ended with the violence at Altamont Speedway, with the Rolling Stones and the Hells Angels and everything that went down. Some people pointed to the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and some the killing of Bobby Kennedy. Some even said it ended when a hippie girl tricked Chester Kilbuck into going into an alley with her, where a bunch of her friends cornered him and beat him to death for his take at the Avalon Ballroom that night. The Avalon closed just a few months later and got converted into a movie theater. The first movie they showed was The Love Bug with Dean Jones. Bobby Lee took his son on the road for a short while, but Emmy Lou Harris called for him to record and tour with her, and once more, Bobby Lee could not deny his son. Chester was three-quarters outlaw, but 
he was the one with the business sense, and Bobby Lee was the one that always got lost in the music. That is why Bobby Lee felt that if Chester made a deal, he should keep it. So Bobby Lee kept doing the circuit, the fairs and the VFWs, and the high school gyms, and if he was doing a show in a nice small town on a Sunday, somebody would always invite him back to their house for fried chicken. As the years went on, Bobby Lee began to understand more of what might have happened that night at the Avalon Ballroom. But he was never really quite sure. Because if you sing the old songs that people wanted to hear, the gospel and the hymns, you had to believe it. You had to believe it, or the audience would know. When you sang, Will the Circle Be Broken?, you had to feel that there was a better home awaiting by and by. So if you believed in one place, it only made sense you believed in the opposite place. There had to be an opposite, just like Kilbuck was the opposite of Star. But they only worked their best together. So if Chester Kilbuck had really stood at the crossroads and made a promise, it was better to keep that promise then cross your fingers and hope that none of it was real. The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe For the most wild yet homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed I would be to expect it in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet, mad am I not? And very surely do I not dream, but tomorrow I die, and today I would unburthen my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world plainly, succinctly, and without comment a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me, yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than Baroque's. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace. Some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive, in the circumstances I detail with awe, nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects." From my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals, and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time, and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth, and, in my manhood, I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early and was happy to find my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured by superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion, which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point, and I mention the matter at all for no better reason than that it happens, just now, to be remembered. Pluto, this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me wherever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. 
Our friendship lasted, in this manner, for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance, had, I blush to confess this, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew, day by day, more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperance language to my wife. At length, I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of the maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when by accident or through affection, they came in my way. But my disease grew upon me, for what disease is like alcohol? And at length, even Pluto, who was now becoming old, and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home, much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence, I seized him when, in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, gin nurtured, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. I blush, I burn, I shudder, while I pen the damnable atrocity. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment, half of horror, half of remorse, for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was, at best, a feeble and equivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched, I again plunged into excess and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but, as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came, as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit philosophy takes no account, yet I am not more sure that my soul lives than I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart. One of the indivisible primary faculties, or sentiments, which give direction to the character of man. Who has not, a hundred times, found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Have we not perpetual inclination, in the teeth of our best judgment, to violate that which is law, merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for wrong's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had afflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cool blood, I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart, hung it because I knew that it had loved me and because I felt it had given me no reason of offense, hung it because I knew that in doing so I was committing a sin, a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it If such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. On the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames. 
the whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete, my entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforth to despair. I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity, but I am detailing a chain of facts and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins, the walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house, and against which had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here, in great measure, resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to its having been recently spread. About this wall a dense crowd were collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attention. The words strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw, as if graven in bas-relief, upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy, truly marvelous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme. But at length reflection came to my aid. The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd, by someone of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of the other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the fumes and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished the portraiture as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just detailed, it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and, during this period, there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal, and to look about me, among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented, for another pet of the same species, and of somewhat similar appearance, with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat, half stupefied in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object, reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum, which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely resembling him in every aspect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white, covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it of the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses, and, when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once, and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated, but, I know not how or why it was, its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed. 
by slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty. Preventing me from physically abusing it, I did not, for some weeks, strike or otherwise violently ill use it. But gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing and to flee silently from its odious presence as if from the breath of a pestilence. What added, no doubt, to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife who, as I have already said, possessed, in a high degree, that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down, or, fastening its long, sharp claws in my dress, clamber in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from doing so, partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by absolute dread of the beast." This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I am almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon cell, I am almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once, to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember about this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful. It had, at length, assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, and for this, above all, I loathed and dreaded and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows. Oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime, of agony and of death! And now was I indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity, and a brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me a man, fashioned in the image of the high God, so much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former the creature left me in no moment alone, and in the latter I started hourly from dreams of utterable fear, to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face, and its vast weight, an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart." Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole intimates. The darkest and most evil of thoughts, the moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind. While from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which I now blindly abandon myself, my uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers. One day she accompanied me, upon some household errand, into the cellar of the old building which our property compelled us to inhabit. 
The cat followed me down the steep stairs and, nearly throwing me headlong, exasperated me to madness, uplifting an axe and forgetting, in my wrath, the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand, I aimed a blow at the animal which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. Goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal, I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot, without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself forthwith, and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body, I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period, I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. At another, I resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar. Again, I deliberated about casting it into the well in the yard, about packing it into a box as if merchandise, with the usual arrangements and so getting a porter to take it from my house. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. I determined to wall it up in the cellar, as the monks of the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed and had lately been plastered, throughout with a rough plaster which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up as before, so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation, I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar, I easily dislodged the bricks and, having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position while, with little trouble, I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair, with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with this I very carefully went over the new brickwork. When I had finished, I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest of care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here, at least, then, my labor has not been in vain." My next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had, at length, firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it, at the moment there could have been no doubt of its fate, but it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep, the blissful sense of relief which the absence of that detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again, I breathed as a free man. The monster, in terror, had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries had been made, but these had been readily answered. Even a search had been instituted, but, of course, nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of police came, very unexpectedly, into the house and proceeded again to make a rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatsoever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end, I folded my arms upon my bosom, and roamed easily to and fro. 
The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee at my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say if but one word by way of triumph and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Gentlemen, I said at last as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this, this is a very well-constructed house. In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say, an excellently well-constructed house. These walls? Are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with a cane which I held in my hand upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch-fiend. No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry, at first muffled and broken, like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud, and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman, a howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony of the demons that exult in the damnation. Of my own thoughts, it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless, through extremity of terror and of awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It felt bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, upon its head, with red extended mouth and a solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. Thank you for listening, but there's a whole lot more you could be binging. So be sure to come back as soon as you can. Until then, you're safe. Trust me. Ha, 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 ha.